Okay, here we are. We're back again. We're picking up our series on the Book of Revelation. In the Book of Revelation series, we started a couple of, or we ended a couple of weeks ago. Now, last week, of course, we had our special update on the war in Israel and how that might relate to the war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel chapter 30, 38 and 39. So if you haven't seen that, uh, go back and take a look at that. We're picking it back up today at Revelation chapter 6, where we see the seven seals that are opened up as part of the Great Tribulation period. So what we're going to do is review everything. We started out in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos in 96 AD and basically shows himself to be the resurrected glorified Christ, uh, a, a figure so terrifying. John passed out. Jesus woke him up and said, hey, uh, wake up. I got to give you some information that I want you to give to the churches and he proceeded in Revelation chapter 2 and in Revelation chapter 3 to give seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor that existed at the time of which we have a type or a shadow or a picture of to this present day and so what we found out in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 is that Jesus made a promise to the church that he would keep the church from out of the tribulation period which was coming upon the earth to judge those that had rejected him during his earthly ministry and during the 2000 year church era it's now 2000 years at the time of john it was about 60 years old and so jesus revealed in revelation chapter 3 verse 10 john tell the churches in this letter that i'm going to keep them out of the tribulation period. Jesus referred to it as the great tribulation period in Matthew chapter 24 um, and said if those days weren't cut short nobody on earth would live. And then he goes on in Revelation chapter 4 to give the command come up here and we found out that in the very next verse of the very next chapter John is snatched up into heaven in a type picture shadow of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church and so we find out that John is now standing up in heaven throne of God and he sees 24 elders which we found out were the 24 representatives of the church which was already in heaven so when John got there he had moved through the space-time continuum and that's kind of depicted or diagram right here here he is on the island of Patmos and then he's snatched up to the Father's house up here. And so now he's in heaven and he sees that the church is already there. How did the church get there? They got raptured there prior to the 70th week of Daniel or the Great Tribulation period or the Day of the Lord's Wrath that is variously referred to in scripture. And so now John has been teleported physically outside the space-time continuum from 96 AD on the island of Patmos where he was in prison for preaching the gospel to the Father's house in heaven where he now sees the collected assembled church that got raptured sometime prior to that and we see Jesus in Revelation chapter 5 being referred to as paradoxically and you know almost contradictorily um, as both the Lamb of God and the Lion out of the tribe of Judah and John is asked the question by one of the angels, who's worthy to open this scroll, which we found was sealed with seven seals and was, in fact, the title deed of the planet Earth that basically had been handed over from God to Adam as the governor of the planet Earth in the name of God, which Adam handed over to Satan when he listened to the voice of his wife rather than the voice of his God. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, that horrible moment has been depicted there. You can take a look at that for a refreshing of your recollection. That transferred control, leadership, ownership, governorship, lordship of the planet Earth from God's appointed man, Adam, to the fallen angel, Lucifer, Satan, the devil. And so what we find out then is that nobody in heaven or on earth, nobody in the church, no saint, no Old Testament guy, nobody in, in heaven, no Archangel Michael, no Gabriel, no Cherubim was found worthy enough to open up those seals and receive it except one person. And that person was the lion out of the tribe of Judah. And John was crying because nobody could open up that deed. He understood it was the title deed to the planet Earth and that that was necessary to rescue black, the citizens of the planet Earth, the human race, from the control and corruption of the devil, which would result eventually in its transference into the lake of fire apart from God forever. So John is crying and then John said, do not weep for behold, the lion out of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open up the seals. And so man, we, he looks at, at at this 
this figure, Jesus, who's being referred to as a lion out of the tribe of Judah, then he appears in the form of a lamb as though he had been slain, which is a paradox. He's this, this, this ferocious lion that's going to bring the judgment of God on the earth for its evil and for rejecting God's get out of hell free card, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then he appears as a lamb that has been slain. What that's doing is painting a picture for us and teaching us that the only way that the human race could be saved is as we saw laid out in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 13, that the figure of the Passover uh, lamb that had to be slain before that very first Passover was a lamb that was spotless and clean and then when you took the blood of that lamb and put it on your doorpost in the form of a cross and this is you know 2000 years before Jesus is born that is the only way that the destroyer who would go through the land that night sent by God would pass over you and not come in to destroy the house and so what we see then is that that is a picture or a type of Jesus, which we now see laid out for us again. In Revelation chapter five, he appears as a lamb as though he's been slain. And then we move on to the next chapter, Revelation chapter six, where we're picking it up right now, where Jesus is now being determined and has, has already been determined to be the only person in the whole universe that's worthy enough to open up that seven seal document called a scroll, the title deed to the planet Earth. And we pick it up here and we look at it and it says, and when I saw the lamb, and we're reading from Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, I saw the lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. And one of the four beasts, and, and this, this term beast doesn't mean like monstrous, but means like a creation, like this incredible creation in heaven. You have the angels, the seraphim, the cherry beam, and these interesting looking creatures. That's where we get the word zoo from from the original Greek there. Not a monstrous beast, but a, a different type of creature that has the appearance of sometimes they look like a human, sometimes they look like uh, one of the animals we have here on earth. But we see then it says um, they heard a noise in heaven and then one of the four beasts said, come and see. In other words, this is something important that John is supposed to take note of so that he can make a note in what we now have as the book of Revelation to see the event that's coming. We talked about the importance of Bible prophecy and how important Bible prophecy is in giving us motivation to live the life in Christ that we have to live. It's gonna be difficult. One, you know, one, uh, you know, uh, pastor that he's passed on now, uh, he died young, but he preached with fire for a long time. Uh, his name was Darby, uh, Stephen Darby. He said, you know, in his prayers to the Lord, he said, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm saved, but you, you know, living for you wasn't an easy thing. And that's the way it is. If you're really born again, it's not gonna be easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ, especially if you follow the strictures of scripture. Now, I'm not talking about just avoiding, you know, having sex with your neighbor's wife or going to strip clubs. Uh, eventually, when we become adults and we grow up, and even though we've lost our childhood innocence, we realize that, you know, open and abject sin eventually leads to an early death and unhappiness and miserableness. So just avoiding that isn't really what's being, you know, pointed out here. But what is being pointed out is that once you believe the gospel, which we're supposed to do, become born again by accepting Jesus as your savior, then we're supposed to study the scriptures, to learn the scriptures, and then we go out and we foretell that information to the people. That's called evangelism. When we go out and give the good news that other people can be saved too by believing on the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But when you do that, which is referred to collectively in Revelation chapter, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 as the great commission, when that's done, you're going to make yourself a target to the kingdom of the air. And the kingdom of the air is run by Satan, right? And he doesn't want the gospel to get out because it foretells his doom and destruction. And it saves the children of men who God created above the angels, which is probably one of the reasons why Satan was so upset with the creation of Adam and so envious was that we are a higher class of being created in the image of God. No angel is created in the image of God. And so as a result of that, we find out that Satan is opposed to the gospel. He's opposed to the children of men becoming saved and forgiven for Adam's mistake in the garden and escaping from his, Satan's eternal destiny in the lake of fire forever. The human race would have to go there, not because God wants them to be there, but because if they're not born again, then they themselves 
cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, which will be universal wide uh, at the end of the space-time continuum, which we're reaching now, the 6,000 years of human history apart from the kingdom of heaven, and then the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, at the conclusion of which eternity will begin again. And then everybody who's anybody who's ever been born has to be placed in one of two places, the kingdom of heaven, which stretches throughout the universe, or the lake of fire, created for Satan and the fallen angels who rebelled long ago and far away. And so that's the gospel. And so you're going to be opposed if you are going out and doing what we're doing right now, which is going out into the public square. You know, every time I come out here and, and, and preach, I'm always nervous because there's always something that might be some demon possessed person who comes up and says and does terrible things. Or maybe somebody from, you know, uh, you know, the park rangers will say, hey, you don't have a permit to do that. And I, I'll have to explain, well, no, I already for the last several years got permission from City Hall and Miami Beach to do this and so on and so forth. So there's always some kind of a distraction that Satan is going to raise up and put in your path if you're trying to do the Great Commission, which is a type of warfare. And it's interesting because Israel is now two weeks into a war. When we last picked up here in Revelation chapter 5, you know, that terrible, horrific assault from the terrorist group Hamas was being made uh, in the northern part or southern part of Israel along the Gaza border and I wasn't even aware of it because I was out here preaching and when I finished preaching I started uploading the message I started getting text messages about what this horrible thing that had just happened in Israel now we know that 14,000 people were killed and 40 babies had their heads decapitated and families were incinerated alive in their homes just because they were Jewish. Just to, to add a point there, that's not a type of warfare that you typically will see in a military conflict over the control of a piece of land or territory. That is what you see in the Old Testament of the Bible, however, as a part of Moloch worship. Moloch required his followers to take their children and sacrifice them by burning them alive in a brass statue of Moloch, the bullheaded god. And we find out that the Ammonites who surrounded Israel did that as well as the Canaanites. The Canaanites did it for their god, Moloch. The Ammonites did it for Milcom, who was just another type of Satan disguised in a religious costume. Moloch, Milcom, Baal, Baal, they all required human blood sacrifice, including the incineration or the burning of babies who were alive. We saw that happen two weeks ago in Israel. And so what we now know from that conflict in Israel, that's not a military conflict over territory like you might see with Russia and Ukraine arguing, well, this part of the land belongs to Ukraine. No, it belongs to Russia and we're going to fight over it. That's a military conflict over a geographical piece of territory. What you're seeing in Israel is a now 3,500 year old conflict over the land that God selected out for himself of all the world that he placed his name on, which is what the term Israel means, a prince with God. That means that God's prince was gonna be coming out of this land and be ruling in this land. And so we find out then for 3,500 years that Israel has been a distinctive created entity, a national geographic nation, if you will, created by God himself and populated with people, Jews, who were created by God himself. We don't have time to go into all of that, but we remember that Abram, who was a Chaldean man, was married to a woman named Sarah, who was a Chaldean girl, and that she had, from her teenage years, been infertile. You know, sometimes women have reproductive problems. They can't get pregnant. And it turned out that Sarah was one of those women that who had been married to Abram from her teenage years all the way up to she was about 90 years old and she couldn't have a baby until God showed up and said, Abram, because of your faithfulness to me, you had rejected the false gods of Chaldea and have worshiped the one true God. I'm going to bless you and your descendants. And I'm going to raise up to you descendants, uh, you know, that'll number the sands of the seashores. And that's where you get the Jews from. And so God supernaturally caused Sarah's 90 year old barren womb to become impregnated with a child named Isaac. And Isaac gave birth to Jacob, and Jacob gave birth to 12 kids. These sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, of which Judah was one. And from out of the tribe of Judah, out of this uh, great-grandson of Abraham, came the line of the Messiah. King David came first, and then thereafter came the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. And that was the whole purpose of Jewish people being placed on the earth and being placed in a special land, a special nation named after God himself, Israel. And so 
When we see on the news there's a conflict between Hamas and Israel or Palestinians in Israel or Iran in Israel or uh, Islam in Israel, remember, it is only outwardly a, uh, what we would call a, a geographical or a geopolitical uh, war. It's really, at the end of the day, a spiritual war. And so, but that's an aside. Anyway, what we talked about was in fact last week when we gave that update on Israel and the war of Gog and Magog, we said that if Islam continued as a worldwide force believing in the one God of Allah, Antichrist would never be able to come to the fore and unite the world together on the false pseudo-Christian new age one world religion where he's the Messiah of the Old Testament but all the other gods and isms and belief systems are syncretized together in this one world religion. Islam wouldn't allow for that. So Islam would have to be taken out of the way. And we opined last week when we looked on our timeline chart, and we'll just go ahead and take a look at that right now, that this is the 70th week of Daniel, which is going to begin in Revelation chapter six. We just talked about and we just read that in Revelation chapter six, when I saw the lamb, he opened one of the seals, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown, and was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That man on that white horse is very similar to what we see several chapters later at the end of the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes to the earth at Armageddon to destroy evil, destroy the Antichrist and establish the kingdom of God on earth for 1,000 years. He comes on a white horse and a white robe. This guy in Revelation chapter 6, who appears only when Jesus in the form of the Lamb opens up that very first of the seven seals, and in verse 2, Behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. But he had a bow but no arrows, and it's been su suggested by many uh, Bible prophecy experts that this is an imitation of the second coming of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19, but Antichrist is not gonna come to the uh, you know throne of the world. He's got the crown, now he's the king of the world, or he becomes the king of the world during this 70th week of Daniel. He's not gonna do it through warfare, through cutting off heads, through military conflagration. He's gonna come through peace. And the guy on the white horse who has a bow but no arrows is a type or a shadow, a picture of, hey, we're not gonna be using bows. There's, there, it's like having a gun with no bullets in it. I'm not intending to shoot or kill anybody or hurt anybody. He comes through peace. And it is during this period that possibly we believe that he establishes a seven year peace treaty with the nation of Israel which is the 70th week of Daniel. Remember, we looked at that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, gives you the first 69 weeks of years, the most amazing prophecy in, uh, prophecy in the Bible that predicts, you know, 483 years to the day, the day that Jesus would appear as the Passover lamb that's typified with Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 13, the last night that Israel was in captivity for 400 years in Egypt. They had to kill the Passover lamb, put blood on the door in the form of a cross and then God led him out of, out, of, out of Egypt. And so we see that the prediction that Jesus would come to be presented as the Passover lamb to die for the sins of the world was predicted 483 years to the day and it occurred um, during the first 69 weeks of years. And then that 70th week of, uh, of Daniel, because Daniel was given a prophecy, you know, he was told in Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks not 70 weeks of days, right? You have seven days in a week, but 70 weeks of years. So you would have seven years in a week. So he was told you're gonna to have 70 weeks of years or 70 times 70 years or 490 total years, prophetically speaking, until the kingdom of heaven is established on earth and the millennial reign of the Messiah will begin. But that 490 prophetic years was divided out into two parts. The first part being 483 years leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus and then separated by the 2000 year parenthetical gap we call the church era, whereupon that 70th week would begin at some point after we found out the rapture of the church. And after the rapture of the church, now Antichrist can be revealed. We found out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 
where God revealed to Paul that the Antichrist couldn't be revealed to the world, couldn't be uh, revealed and come out until after the church was taken out of the way. And we don't have time to look at that, but we've got some teachings on that. Look at the rapture teaching we did not too long ago in South Beach Gospel Ministries. If you haven't liked and subscribed yet, please do. When you like the video, it pushes the algorithm up and it goes to a thousand more screens around the world. So do that. We're now on Telegram as well, where we can do messaging and things of that nature. And uh, Facebook and Rumble. So South Beach Gospel Ministries on YouTube, South Beach Gospel Ministries on Rumble, and you can now find us on uh, Facebook and uh, Telegram as well. So anyway, what we pointed out was that the rapture would have to come first and then the Antichrist would be allowed to be revealed. That's what we're looking at in Revelation chapter 6 verse 1. We're seeing that Jesus himself is the person that releases the Antichrist on the earth. And why does he do it now? He had to wait. He couldn't do it a long time ago. He couldn't do it right now because the church is still there. Antichrist would immediately go to the church and destroy the church first because Antichrist knows that the church is the bride of Christ to be. And so Antichrist, this man we sort of have depicted right here, Antichrist, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7 through 13, calls him a beast. And we find 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the lawless one, the man of sin who can't be revealed, until the church is removed from out of the way. And then in John chapter 5, we find out that he's the one who comes in his own name. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the son of perdition. Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, the rider on the white horse that we just talked about. Some of the attributes of this Antichrist guy that we're looking at that just got released by Jesus himself in Revelation chapter 2, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, is that he's going to be an intellectual genius. How do I know? Because it said so in Daniel chapter 7, verse 20, Daniel chapter 8, verse 23, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 3. He's going to be imbued or indwelt by Satan himself, the most intelligent creature in all of the universe. The most powerful, intelligent creature in all the universe is Satan, our adversary and God's adversary. Another attribute of the Antichrist, a persuasive orator. We find that, again, Daniel chapter 7, verse 20, Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. He's going to be a shrewd politician. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. And that's probably why he's going to be able to broker a peace treaty that wouldn't be possible as long as Islam is on the earth. So if, as we suggested last week in our uh, Gog Magog update, Israel Bible Prophecy Update that after the rapture of the church, sometime during the first half of that seven, 70th week of that last seven year period of time, remember there's a total of 490 prophetic years, the first 483 already occurred up to the crucifixion of Jesus, the last seven years would occur during the 70th week of Daniel and that will be triggered by what? Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 when we find out that a covenant is confirmed for one week. And many Bible prophecy expositors suggest that this is a peace treaty brokered by the Antichrist, who comes not as a devil or as a monster or as a bad guy in the beginning. He comes, remember, he's the guy with the bows and no arrow, riding on a white horse with a crown. He's going to come as the king of peace. And he finally is going to resolve the conflict between the uh, Muslims and the other religious people of the world over the Temple Mount and the rebuilding of the temple. And it's believed that at this time, when the covenant is confirmed for one week or a seven year peace treaty, Israel will be allowed to rebuild this temple that it was destroyed in 70 AD, which has to be standing when the Antichrist is on earth because halfway through the 70th week, he goes into the temple and declares himself to be God, the abomination of desolation. So we suggested to you last week that it might go something like this, rapture of the church. After that, now, the church is in heaven. Jesus now can open up the first of the seven seals on that scroll, which will release the rider on the white horse with bows but no arrows and a crown, the Antichrist. Antichrist will then broker a seven-year peace treaty, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which will allow Israel to rebuild their temple. And we find out then that at some point after that, the war of Gog and Magog occurs, and it may be that Islam is so incensed and so enraged at uh, Israel being able to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount, which they claim is now a sacred spot for Islam as well. Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem are supposedly the three holy spots, and they want the Temple Mount for themselves, and they would never stand by idly or quietly while the temple is being rebuilt. 
could it be that this is another one of the motivations that causes that coalition of nations, and we talked about what, who those nations would be. Those nations would be, uh, you know, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, as well as the, the former Islamic republics of the Soviet Union, Roche, Gog, Magog, we found out again, Turkey, Russia, Iran are all presently involved in the current conflict going on in the Middle East right now. Turkey hasn't come out on the side of either one yet, but has basically been making comments that suggest that they're on the same side as Russia and Iran against Israel. And that's what you would need to have for the War of Gog and Magog, because these nations are now going to invade Israel out of the north. And it says in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 that God himself supernaturally destroys. So this peace treaty that the Antichrist, probably arising from out of the west, a leader arising out of the west, the Antichrist, allowing the Sevan and Russia, and it will lead to the invasion. Maybe the, to take a spoil would be to take the Temple of God on the Temple Mount, which is now just recently rebuilt, and turning it into the great shrine of Mecca, you know, like Mecca. They, they have their al Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount. They may take or have an idea to either destroy the Temple of God on the Temple Mount or convert it into an Islamic mosque. And so, what we see is that how, for whatever the, the motivation is, they invade and they're supernaturally destroyed over the mountains of Israel. Now you have Russia gone, you have Iran gone, you have fundamentalist Islam gone, which would never allow an Antichrist figure to unite all the nations of the world together under a... And then the whole world has to bow the knee to him because he's the most powerful guy in the world. There's no one to oppose him. Islam's gone now. Russia's gone now. Iran's gone now. And the mark of the beast system is instituted. And if you don't take it, you can't buy or sell. And you get your head cut off and all of that. And martyrdom becomes the name of the game in the world at this point. So, again, Antichrist attributes, in addition to being a shrewd politician, he's going to be a financial wizard. So he'll solve all of the economic problems that the world is now undergoing, which I would suggest to you is being manipulated by the powers that be, that control the corporations, that control the nation, that control the central banks. And this is all being orchestrated to force all of the nations to come together in a sort of socialistic society that Antichrist will rule over and the mark of the beast system will have total control. He's going to be a military leader. Eventually, he's going to become militarily aggressive. And that won't come until after Islam is destroyed and maybe the war of Gog and Magog is something he's going to try to take credit for. See, God was acting on my behalf because I let you guys rebuild your temple. And so the God of heaven, who is my father, let, uh, you know, destroyed Islam for you. Now you got to worship me because God wants me to be the ruler of the world. And so he's a powerful organizer, we find in Revelation chapter 13. He's a unifying religious guru. We find that from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, and verses 14 through 15. And physical description, interestingly enough, Zechariah refers to him as having a deadly head wound, excuse me, uh, one eye, you know, one eye is darkened. And Revelation chapter 13 talks about him having a deadly head wound. Maybe. Uh, there's an assassination attempt on the Antichrist sometime after this war of Gog and Magog is won. And then when he supernaturally rises from the dead, just like Jesus did, he now has a mark or a scar where the assassin attempt occurred. Maybe somebody shot him through the eye with a gun. And when he rises from the dead, the whole world says, who can make war against him? You know, the whole world wondered after the beast, who can make war with a guy who can't die? And that is the, the thing that pushes the world over into the worship of Antichrist is more than just a great political leader, more than a great military leader, more than an intellectual genius, but as a type of deity in human flesh and therefore the abomination of desolation at the halfway point of the seven year period can occur. When Antichrist declares himself to be God in human flesh, the Messiah of Israel and the savior of the world, and if you don't believe it, now he can start killing people. So as ethnicity, there's an argument, you know, if he's Gentile, would the Jews be deceived into accepting him as the Messiah? Possibly. It says that he is of the people of, you know, the prince of the people that shall come and destroy the temple. The people that destroyed the temple um, in Jesus' day were the Romans. And so if he is a prince of Rome, many people suggest he would be a Gentile. 
uh, from Western Europe possibly. But Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 25 and 27 uh, makes some suggestions that some people say, well, maybe he's Jewish or maybe he's both. Have to watch our kids be martyred. We just saw in the land of Israel two weeks ago where this Islamic horde cut off the heads of Jewish babies, not because they were a military threat, but because they were making a blood ritual religious sacrifice to the God that rules over them. Now, they can call him Allah, but that sounds like Moloch to me from the Old Testament. When you cut off babies' heads and burn babies alive and burn human beings alive to assuage your God, that sounds a lot like Baal, uh, Milcom, and Moloch of the Old Testament, which was practice daily by the nations surrounding the little land of Israel in the Old Testament, which is why God had to separate Israel out, not because Jewish people were better, but because he wanted people that were specifically set apart for him so that he could introduce the Messiah into the world to save the whole human race, which is exactly what happened. And that's why he's called the second man and the last Adam to uh, you know, distinguish him from the first man, the original Adam, who fell and condemned the whole race because of his fall by listening to the voice of his wife rather than the voice of his God. That same way, God repeats it, but this time he sends a second man who is a perfect Adam, who does not fall into sin. And because of the second man, the last Adam's perfect life, he can now substitute in for the first man, the original Adam, and now everybody who believes through faith can now be forgiven and obtain the eternal life that we were always supposed to have through Adam if he had not fallen. So anyway, that was an aside, but we're gonna see in Revelation chapter six, and that's your homework, read through that as after you go through this, and you'll see that there is a total of seven different seals. The first is the Antichrist is revealed on the world. And the second one is the red horse of war and bloodshed. The third seal is the black horse of famine. These are referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's a popular idiom in, in, in literature now, in language, in pop culture. Everybody knows about, you know, the four horsemen, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you're, you don't have to be a Christian, you don't have to be Jewish, you don't have to even be biblically or religiously literate and you're familiar with that idiom because it's so uh, prevalent in the zeitgeist of the world as we live now. And so what we see then is that the next one or the fourth of those seven seals in heaven. Who are these guys? These are the martyrs of God who have refused to bow the knee to the Antichrist and have come to their senses and realized that the gospel of Jesus Christ was all truth and eventually they're going to be put to death and we pick that up in verse 9 and it says and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth and so they were told um, in fact, at verse 11, it says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So what we find out then is that believing on Jesus by faith isn't going to get you saved after the rapture. It's going to have to be believing on Jesus by faith plus martyrdom or being willing to accept martyrdom that is going to be required. And these guys accepted it boldly and bravely. And as their souls were gathered, remember, they, they haven't been raptured, so they don't have their resurrection body. The church is already in heaven in their glorified resurrection bodies. That's how come they can sit in, in seats and thrones around the throne of God. And the 24 elders can come and walk and talk and interact with John in physical form. But the souls are under the altar waiting for their physical resurrection, which won't occur until the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the 70th week. So they're saying, Lord, how long are we going to have to sit here? How long is it going to be until you avenge us? And, he, and, and, and the Lord says, wait a little while longer until the full number of martyrs that are going to die for Christ during this terrible time known as the Great Tribulation period is fulfilled. And then God will allow Jesus to come back at the sec second coming. And so then we get to uh, the sixth seal 
which is a great earthquake and all kinds of strange astronomical uh, uh, occurrences. You know, it says that the moon became as blood, a great earthquake occurred, the sky became black as sackcloth, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. The stars of heaven probably is an idiom referring to fallen angels, and they were the old gods of the pre-Noahic flood. When the fallen angels came down to the earth after being exiled from heaven, they were worshipped as gods and they interacted with human beings. In fact, the Bible even says in Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 that they married women, human women, and raised up a whole race of hybridized humanoids called the Nephilim collectively in the Bible, and that that occurred because humans and angels were interacting together as God forbid. And so what we see is that they were eliminated from the earth by the flood of Noah, and they were eliminated out of Canaan by the creation of the nation of Israel. And then as Jesus spread the gospel even to the Gentiles and the Jews were dispersed from uh, Israel during the diaspora that started in 70 AD when the Romans kicked all the Jews out of Israel. And then in 135 AD when they renamed uh, the land of Israel, Syria, Palestina, which is where you get the term Palestine from. Palestine isn't a real nation. It isn't a real ethnic group of distinct people. It's a name that the Romans superimposed on the land of Israel because they were angry at the Jews for not accepting the Roman pantheon of gods and their stubborn insistence upon worshiping only the God of Jacob. So the Roman emperor at that time decided as the ultimate insult, not only chase them out of their land, but to rename their former country named in the name of God, Israel, name it after their ancient uh, you know, enemy. The Philistines, you know, uh, Samson was killed in the temple of Dagon by the Philistines after being seduced by the Philistine seductress Delilah. King David had to kill the Nephilim giant Superman who was the super soldier who was a soldier of fortune working for the Philistines and he killed him with a slingshot and eventually became the king of Israel. So we know throughout the Old Testament that the Philistines were, it's kind of like the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry in college football. The Philistines versus Israel was the big rivalry until God wiped out the Philistines centuries before the birth of Christ. So by the time Jesus came, there were no more Philistines anywhere in the world. There was no more Philistia anywhere in the world. And so what Caesar did in 135 AD, or 135 years after Jesus, or 100 years after Jesus rose from the dead, he renamed the land of Israel in the name of the great enemy of the God of Israel as an insult to the God of the Bible and as an insult to the people of the God of the Bible. Not because he believed there was some ethnic group there that were actually modern day Philistines. There are no more Hittites and there are no more Philistines anywhere in the world. And so that's where the term Palestine comes, but it's useful uh, as a sort of political intrigue to cause this dispute to go on and go on between the God of Israel, which is represented by Judeo-Christianity, Jews in Israel, and modern day Islam. Modern day Islam make great use of the idea that the Palestinian people are an indigenous ethnic group that have always been there dating all the way back to Adam and Eve, which is simply not the case. Okay, but there you go. So we're gonna close it up now as we're getting close to time, trying to keep it short for you guys so you guys can get on with the rest of your day. But again, we have that seventh seal that has to be opened and that seventh seal causes silence. A golden censer is waved. There's silence in heaven, why? It's been suggested that's because the seventh seal now triggers the next seven of these three sets of sevens of judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, which are going to be even worse than the seven uh, seal judgments. And then the seventh of the seven trumpets uh, judgments is going to open up the seven bowl judgments, which will, will be the last seven judgments on the planet Earth prior to the second coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon and the conclusion of it all. So again, the seven seals we have laid out for us now, when does it occur? Many people have suggested, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Amen. So that's, and again, that's another reason why we come out. Hey, that's right. Amen. She says there's light in a dark place and that's exactly right. That's the whole point there. That's why we come out here to preach the gospel. We do a, a longer teaching 
a house church, in-house, either in my home or in other people's home. But the reason why you come out and do it publicly is so that people can see, as, as these two ladies that just walked by on their way to the beach said, hey, this is light in a dark place. South Beach has beautiful palm trees, the sun is shining, it's a glorious day. But darkness spiritually it prevails up and down Ocean Drive uh, because the world has rejected largely the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's why we come out. We do it here so that people can see and hear this that aren't going to go to a church or aren't going to go to a YouTube page dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why you guys should go out and do the very same thing because you can get rewards in heaven that the church now in Revelation chapter 6, the church has already at this point probably received their rewards at the Mima Seat Judgment. So even if you're saved, you're going to be judged by how you lived your life after you got saved and we're gonna see what rewards you're gonna get. So again, you have uh, seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and seven bowl judgments. And each one of those series of seven becomes progressively worse. It has been suggested by some that the first uh, six of those seals that are open that we just went through today happened during the period of time that, here we are, it's the 70th week, that it probably happens during the first two years of that seven year period of time that we're calling the 70th week of Daniel or the tribulation and great tribulation period. Some others have suggested that the sixth seal might not occur until as late as the fifth year. I tend to agree with those that say it happens probably within the first 21 months of the 70th week of Daniel, which, which is triggered by the rapture of the church in that seven year covenant. Probably during the first 21 months or it's just short of two years, these first six seals, Antichrist is revealed, and then the other five seals that come after Antichrist, which result in cataclysmic uh, you know, changes to the heavens. The sun goes dark, uh, fallen angels come to the earth in physical form again, just like they did prior to the flood of Noah. Latins, babies do not have political value. Um, that was a blood sacrifice. That was, that was Moloch. That was Moloch worship. That was Baal worship. That was Melcom worship. Killing babies, spilling their blood to appease your God. So that's what we see happening. So pray for the peace of, of Jerusalem. I've, I've had people inquire, hey, is it right to support the Palestinians or is it right to support Israel? Aren't Palestinians just an oppressed ethnic minority, sort of like you know black people in America in the 1950s and 60s? And the answer is no, for the reason we already stated, if they're not a distinctive indigenous people that have always existed, but really the term Palestinian is just a term that was superficially created by a pagan Western European uh, godless maniac of a ruler, Caesar. And again, that term has been useful uh, for the last 30 or 40 years. If you want to study or deeper dive into that, there's an excellent book out there. Hopefully Amazon hasn't banned yet. It's called From Time Immemorial by Joan Peters. From time immemorial, horrific time known as the 70th week of Daniel, where these seal judgments are open, that Israel is going to begun, begin the, the painful process of coming to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They already believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Bible, but they just don't believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. During the seven year period of Daniel, uh, of time known as Daniel's 70th week, the great tribulation period, they're going to begin to come to that realization. So, scripture says, all Israel that hasn't already been killed by Antichrist by the end of the tribulation period, all Israel will be saved because they will have all come to faith in Jesus Christ. So we got to give them that space of time because God commands us to. And until then, we pray for them, we support them ideologically. And so that means that when somebody asks you, do you support it? You, you should tell them if you're a part of the body of Christ. Absolutely we do. And rather than getting involved in some internecine political or geopolitical argument about why, the simple answer is because God said so. And then there's other political reasons you could use. But the bottom line, best answer is we support Israel because God said so. And so since God created them and they're God's kids, we'll let God work out the details of getting them saved and get them into the kingdom of heaven. Right now, we just support them um, uh, until God takes care of that. So we pray for them. We pray for the hostages that are still being held and used as bargaining chips for Hamas, who says, 
we want to be forgiven for killing 1,400 people two weeks ago. If you just drop it and forget that ever happened, including the 40 babies that were decapitated simply because they were Jewish, then we'll release the other, you know, 120 hostages that they've got held or so. Maybe it's uh, closer to 200. But either way, it just there's something terribly wrong about that, that you can go out, kill 1,400 innocent people, including decapitating 40 innocent babies, and then, because you decided not to kill 200 of them, you say, if we let the rest of these 200 go and not kill them, um, like we killed the first 1,400, Will you forgive us and just drop and pretend like it never happened? That, to me, that's, that's not justice. And God, in the Old Testament, you would never see that being approved. The priest of Baal would not be allowed to kill 1,400 people. And then when Elijah comes to bring the wrath of God down upon them, say, well, you know what? There are, there are a couple more people that we were going to kill. But if we don't kill them, uh, will you forgive us for slaughtering you know, all the people we already killed? So that doesn't make sense. So that's an aside, but we support Israel not for political reasons, but for biblical reasons, because God says so. So pray for them, and that's it. Hopefully this is helpful. Go out and do evangelism for what little time we have left, and then you're going to have a great reward in heaven for doing it. So, this minute is signing out. God bless you. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.